Okay. Usually. That's that's not so much to not hear you talking as it is background noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a good Friday morning to you. Thank you for taking some time to be here with us for what we like to call an hour of power. This is the Preterist Power Hour. I get to be your host, I'm Mike Miano, the director of the Power of Preterism Network, which of course, the Preterist Power Hour, power hour is a ministry through. You can learn more about the Power of Preterism Network by visiting powerofpreterism.com. Uh, also, of course, visiting our blog site, powerofpreterism.wordpress.com, where we regularly pro post updates, articles, resources, uh, all sorts of things that would uh, edify your walk and encourage you uh, to learn more about preterism or to learn more about the Christian faith and uh, what exactly we mean by that word. I have to say, uh, just at the outset, um, yesterday was National Day of Prayer. And interestingly enough, uh, there I was standing in the foyer of the Blue Point Bible Church, and a woman came up to me and said, what is this word you talk about all the time? Pre pre preterism. And I said, well, uh, I'm glad that you would ask. And I had opportunity to share. And uh, the, the good thing about it was being that the day was focused on unity and prayer, uh, the Lord blessed me with just a very succinct way of responding. I said, well, most Christians are waiting for Bible prophecy to be, to be fulfilled. You know, the coming of the Lord, some might include the rapture, some might include the millennium, uh, you know, and all these different es es eschatological end times details. I said, well, I'm not waiting for them. I'm living in what they provided. I said, that's that's preterist. I said, now there might be some preterists that would give you a different rendition of that. They might say it's all in the past. I said, just like you might meet some people that believe uh, in the futurist view, if you will. I said, that would be the counterpart of preterism. Uh, some that believe in the futurist view who say it's all in the future or the rapture could happen at any moment. But then you'll have folks that will say, well, no, uh, we need to go to the mountains and then the coming of the Lord will happen. There's, there's variety. So yes, there's variety within preterism as well. And I stopped talking and just left it like that. And she said, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm living the resurrection. I said, you sure are. And, and then we just, you know, I was so encouraged to get a very succinct, simple response. Uh, and then I'm sure she's going to Google it and we'll see where it'll go from there. So, uh, you know, that's why we do programs like this to uh, try to be on the front lines, try to offer up clarity, healing and strategy in regards to these fulfilled truths that we celebrate that we've come to know. And I pray that this morning is exactly that uh, for you. I'm excited to move in on our program. We have some new voices, new faces uh, to be here with us, returning faces, if you will. Uh, let me go ahead and open us in a word of prayer, and then I'll launch right in on what we have planned for you here on today's Preterist Power Hour. Mighty God, we do thank you. We praise you for your work in our lives. We praise you for your work in our churches, in our communities, Lord, in our nation, and in our world. Uh, Lord, we ask that you continue to give us the eyes to see and ears to hear, uh, that we would be relishing our identity as your people, as those that have come to know the truth, those that have been given spiritual discernment. Lord, we're surely not know-it-alls, so we ask that you uh, continue to provide knowledge. We, we are to possess knowledge, but we are also called to increase in knowledge, so that requires each of us to know that there's things we just don't know. Uh, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that the secret things belong with you, and we can, uh, when there, we find ourselves at moments of misunderstanding or confusion, uh, we can rest in the fact that you are a sovereign, providential, all-knowing God. So, Lord, we magnify your name this morning. We thank you for your work. Uh, we praise you. We pray uh, for each of our, each of the group here. Uh, I thank you for the minds and hearts that you've brought together, uh, that you continue to bring together for your glory. And I ask that you just lead us forward with, again, clarity, healing, and strategy. Lord, be glorified through our time and edify us as you always do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, today is Flashback Friday. So usually what we do on a Flashback Friday is we kind of run back to our resources, review things that we talked about. Uh, if you were tuned in on Monday morning, we had Rick, um, we didn't have Rick, we had Bill Evans. We have Rick here with us today, Rick Welch, returning with us after sharing his testimonial uh, a couple months ago. Um, that's Rick Welch from the Burroughs of Berea podcast. If you haven't listened, you've been missing out. So, uh, you know, Bill Evans joined with us on Monday. We talked with him a bit about the Berean Bible Church Conference. Uh, obviously, Gary DeMar has been, uh, you know, a name that we've repeated for months. Some would say ad nauseum uh, at this point. Uh, however, you, you know, his ministry has been very beneficial to many of us. And uh, it's exciting to see that he was at the Berean Bible Church Conference. And then, of course, Berean always puts together a host of excellent speakers. Bob Cruikshank Jr. is actually here with us today as well. So we'll get to hear from him a bit. He was one of the speakers there at Berean Bible Church Conference this year and uh, years prior, of course, 
I know uh, I often say that uh, Bob's my millennium guy, uh, as he's preached about the millennium before, uh, and a lot of other great teachings that you should be privy to, because we've shared them here uh, on the Power of Preterism Network and also through our blog site. So uh, jumping in, uh, and also, by the way, it's Freestyle Friday, so we kind of have opportunity to talk about whatever. But as I look back at my week, uh, yesterday being National Day of Prayer, you know, there were people gathered all across the U United States, uh, even all the world, uh, gathering together, uniting in prayer and finding unity in whatever ways they could. Uh, and I think that's beautiful that Christians were praying. You know, there was a gentleman I debated back in 2014, another pastor here on Long Island. It was great to see that he was praying on National Day of Prayer. He did an event. So that's unifying. We're all praying in the name of Jesus. We're all praying in, in general. Uh, in, how beautiful is that? So uh, I was encouraged by that. And what I wanted to share with you very briefly, I'm hoping that YouTube won't have a problem with me sharing this clip, as sometimes when I share YouTube clips, they kind of try to chop out my, uh, my segments. However, uh, I wanted to share with you a clip from the National Day of Prayer live stream last night, uh, a man named Francis Chan. Some of you might be familiar with him. He served in ministry years ago. He's written a couple books. He offered up a prayer that I wanted you to hear, and that'll kind of segue into some of my thoughts and lead us further in our program today. If you'll just bear with me, I'm going to throw that on the screen and play, play his short thoughts and prayer for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I think we all know that God's heart for the church is that it would become perfectly one, perfectly united. That's what Jesus prayed for. We, we, we worship a God who's perfectly one and he wants us to be in him and, and for us as a body, his family to be perfectly united. And people ask me, well, how do you see the church coming together? How is this going to happen? And my answer is, I have no clue. Um, Ephesians 4 tells us, Paul says, I therefore, prisoner for the Lord Jesus, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. He's calling us to be gentle, humble, eager to be one. And yet it seems like the church is getting more individualistic and proud. And I'm the only one who has my theology straight. And everyone else, you know, just needs to come on board with my, you know, and yet we want to be a church that cares about theology and cares about morality. And so how is this all going to come together? I just go... That's what the National Day of Prayer is all about, where we humble ourselves and come before God and go, we know you want it. And we just humble ourselves and say, I have no idea how this is going to happen. But we also know that it happened once before. And so God could cause it to happen again. Let me just read from Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. The full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Father, we come before you. God, we have no answers, no strategy, no clue as to how the church could become one again. But we know this is your desire. And we're saying it is our desire too. So would you humble us? Give us faith that you could miraculously bring your church together and open our eyes to show us our part in that. But ultimately, God, we give up. None of our strategies have worked. 
And so we bow before you and just ask you to do it. Please, for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hopefully you find yourself saying amen with that as well. And what I appreciated, and the reason I wanted to share that with you this morning, was the humility that Francis Chan has oftentimes, always, in, in any time I've listened to him, uh, he brings out that humility. And by the way, I don't know that I have to tell you this, but I will. Francis Chan is not a preterist. At least I've never heard that he identifies as a preterist. And yet I want you to notice that he said, how do you see the church coming together? I have no clue. So as I listened to that last night and again this morning, I thought about the fact that, well, we have to let God do what God wants to do. Amen. We have to be open to God's move. And what I wrote here in my notes, I'll just share very briefly, was uh, we have to decide if we want to follow scripture or man-made ideas and designs. Uh, and that's what, you know, right now there's like a wrestling match taking place in the Christian church where there's a lot of folks that want to continue things the way they've always been, always been. Uh, you, you know, if you look back through church history, it's fairly hard to say this is the way that it's always been. There's a lot of debates and controversies and challenges all throughout church history. So uh, as I've pondered uh, this prayer, and as of course pondered strategy in general, uh, we'll share some of that uh, when we talk about the Berean Bible Church Conference. I shared a little bit of my frustration on Monday. Uh, however, uh, what I'm discerning, and I imagine many of us are, is that we have to get outside of our comfort zone. We hear that so many times. I've heard that in futurist churches. I preach that as a preterist pastor, that we need to be outside of our comfort zone, that uh, God does things that are sometimes stretching us. Peter, get out of the boat. Uh, you know, Peter knew that if that was Jesus, he's going he's gonna to tell me to get out of the boat. Uh, he knew that he identified with that. Jesus challenges our comfort zone. Uh, there's going to be required paradigm shifts when uh, you know we, re we consider what God is doing in his church in 2023. Uh, then we also need to have some serious conversa excuse me, conversations. Uh, just yesterday, I found myself comparing, you know, many of you know my personal life. Uh, so I found myself saying, you know, when I was a man waiting for a child to be born, uh, there was a very big difference than the man that's caring for the child that has been born. Uh, and I believe that the church needs to have these serious conversations, you know, preparing to get married uh, versus living in a marriage. Uh, we talked on Monday about building a house and then moving into the house and deciding, you know, what goes in what room and, you know, how we maintain the cleanliness of certain rooms. These are serious conversations that the church needs to have in regards to God's work in the church. Uh, are we waiting for something or are we living in something? Do we maybe need to consider what goes in certain rooms, so to speak, uh, you know, rather than saying, well, the house is going to be built at any moment. God's going to build the house or has he built the house? And now we're moving in and when we're figuring out new things. I really do believe uh, we need to ask ourselves, where we, are we in the plan? Uh, and I believe that as the church grows and has conversations about these things, we can see a lot of health and maybe answers to uh, Francis Chan's prayer there uh, that he lifted up on the National Day of Prayer. Uh, I'm also in the middle. This might also be encouraging some of my thoughts. I'm in the middle, or I just finished this morning, reading Daniel Rogers' book, How a 25-Year-Old Learned He Wasn't the Only One Going to Heaven. And there were two quotes that I took from the book just this morning that I believe lends to this conversation. The first thing is that he said, we need to have a unity. We need to move away from unity in conformity and have comfortability with unity and diversity. And many of you know that I've talked about this. Uh, matter of fact, forget me, the Apostle Paul talked about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Romans chapter 14, uh, two texts that we know talk about liberty. Uh, there's some very simple texts there. Let every man be convinced in his own mind. Uh, you know, I found myself even on National Day of Prayer talking about convictions. There's things that you might have heard from the preacher down the road on National Day of Prayer that you might not ever hear from me simply because it's not my conviction. Do I have to make it my business to speak against his? Not necessarily. Uh, we, I can speak my convictions and he can speak his. And perfectly, we're both finding unity in the truths that we're sharing. Daniel Rogers also went on to say this, when we make inferential truth, again, that's truth that's you know, uh, derived from our study and, and you know, what we've learned, when we begin to have inferential truth as the basis of our unity, we make it impossible to have unity with anyone other than ourselves because we're all coming at this through different lenses, different perspectives. There's something different you read this morning than what I read, something different maybe you were burdened with this morning that I was. Uh, so again, we have different inroads. So it's safe to say that the outroads, so to speak, uh, are going to be different. 
than one another. And we need to learn how to become comfortable with that. And that's why I appreciate what we do here on the Preterist Power Hour. Uh, you know, we have we have difference of opinions here and there. Glad to say for the most part, we're fairly in line, or we might just be adding another element to a perspective rather than necessarily differing. But there are times where we have different perspectives and we've learned how to live together uh, Despite that, you know, I, I'm imagining for the married folks that are here, you know, there's times where, uh, you, you know, you're, you're realizing there's differences in your marriage, and you have to learn how to deal with those differences in, in a way that creates cohesion, creates unity uh, in your marriage, remembering your bond of love, your bond of unity. So uh, just thinking about that as we're coming out of National Day of Prayer, and praising God for, of course, uh, the voices, the wisdom that we have within the preterist community that seem to be urging us in that direction. Some other flashback thoughts I might mention with you, speaking about differences and debating, et cetera, uh, just yesterday was, of course, the five-year anniversary of my debate with Sam Frost, my second debate. I've debated the man twice now. And, uh, you know, I bring this up because I think it's encouraging to go back and review these debates, ask ourselves what things are being said, uh, what things were said in the debate that maybe I need to explain better. Uh, what things did Sam Frost say back in 2019 that now he's saying something different? Uh, who has added to that conversation? Obviously, I mentioned the Gary DeMar controversy because that has surely added to uh, some of the, the previous debates that preterists have had with the quote unquote futurist community uh, and uh, continues to kind of uh, lead in on that. So I encourage you to go back. Uh, Check out the, I think it was called the great debate, way to puff men up. Um, you know, the great debate there, uh, you know, that uh, we did back in 2019. And if you, you know you're interested and you want to continue to follow the vein of debates, uh, you could go back to 2013 when I debated Sam there as well and hear the different uh, perspectives that were offered. I will let you know Sam had said some things different in 2013 than he said in 2019. Uh, so check them out, be encouraged by them. Uh, I always think it's good to do throwbacks, flashbacks, and uh, do some review in that regard. Uh, kind of bringing us to the date, uh, many of you know for the past two months I've labored in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in my sermons. I upload all of my sermons, the written notes. Uh, they might not make as much sense to you as they do to me when I'm reading them. However, you can read them, those notes, as well as hear the audio of the worship service and the sermons I preach at the Blue Point Bible Church by simply visiting Miano Gone Wild wordpress.com. I upload, we have all part eights up there for you. I completed first Corinthians chapter 15. I made it out alive and uh, you can review those resources and let me know your questions, your comments, your uh, thoughts. Even let me say this, if you did not review the resource, my resources, my sermons, etc., uh, but you have questions about first Corinthians chapter 15, I welcome them as well. So please send them my way. Uh, this coming Sunday, I'm actually looking to, uh, sum up the letter of 1 Corinthians. Obviously, chapter 16, Paul kind of just gives some salutations and blessings. Uh, I'll be doing the same all the while responding to questions, comments, concerns regarding 1 Corinthians 15 that have been sent to me uh, throughout this past week. Uh, so if you want to add to the fray, please send me an email, pastormikemiano at yahoo.com. Find me on Facebook. Uh, type the comments or questions in the comment box here on our Facebook video, and all of that will be welcomed. So, uh, Another thing I have to mention, uh, we've been going at a study here called After AD 70 uh, at the Blue Point Bible Church. We've been in this study for three years, and we've only journeyed to the year 230. Uh, so uh, it's been quite the study. We've done, you know, we've read a lot of the church fathers. Uh, we've read their literature. We've asked ourselves two particular questions. What was the social environment like, and what was the theological environment like? Reason being is even right now in our day, we're noticing that the social environment sort of leans in on the theological concepts. There's things that we talk about theologically because of what's going on socially. Dare I say preterism is having its moment uh, in, in Christianity because of where we're at socially. Uh, people are asking a lot of questions. Some people think things are out of sync. Some people are looking for consistency. And uh, you know, and there's a lot of other things I could say why socially it's coming up. Uh, however, it's a part of our study. So uh, we're going to be, and I've been putting out these studies, by the way, if you were to Google after AD 70, you should be able to find the different studies. Uh, we're currently up to talking about Tertullian. Uh, interesting because uh, we've had some discussions more recently about the Trinity. Uh, Tertullian was the first person to use the, use the word in Latin, Trinitas, where we get the word Trinity from. Uh, so, you know, definitely somebody interesting to learn from. I'm going to be posting some resources throughout this weekend that you can learn more about Irenaeus and Tertullian, this period of church history and do some discerning for yourself. I try to uh, provide reading, audio, as well as video resources 
for your edification. And of course, Dallas, uh, that helped me uh, think about some of the things you've been bringing up. And uh, Tertullian, as I mentioned, I think on Monday, Tertullian wouldn't have been a fan of Dallas's latest video uh, at Better Understanding the Bible. However, uh, Barton Stone, you know, Church of Christ teacher would have. Uh, so I've actually learned a little bit about, about that from uh, Daniel Rogers' book, where there were some within the Church of Christ that were questioning certain uh, theological views of the Trinity and, and things like that. And um, that's actually where Daniel made that quote. When we make our inferential truth the basis of our unity, we make it impossible to have unity with anyone other than ourselves. And uh, yeah, so, you know, good conversation. I, I look forward to leaning in on that uh, in weeks to come. I'm still reviewing Dallas's video uh, where a lot of that conversation has been coming up. I encourage you to go ahead and visit Better Understanding the Bible to do so as well. Last thing I'll bring up, and then I'm going to unmute and bring on Rick Welch from Burroughs of Berea podcast and a host of other efforts he's involved in and work he does. Uh, and we're going to bring him on, have some chat with him, uh, talk a bit about the Berean Bible Church Conference, and then maybe we'll even unmute Bob and bring Bob in on that conversation as well and have these brothers who are on the scene at Berean Bible Church uh, share with us. Uh, hopefully you've been made your way over to YouTube. Uh, I know a couple of the videos from the conference have been uploaded. However, even on our uh, Flashback Friday last week, if you go to our blog site, we shared a live stream uh, that all the videos are available there. So I've been making my way. I've listened to Gary DeMar three times at this point uh, and then uh, still working my way on the second time listening to Zach Davis. So I want to encourage you folks, go over there, visit the conference and uh, be blessed. Last thing I'll bring up would be next weekend, Saturday, May 13th, Fulfilled Media Presents uh, is going to be an online conference. I think there's like close to 30 of us uh, that are participating in this online conference. And uh, basically next Saturday, if you have nothing to do, you can just sit there and watch a bunch of preterists talk. Uh, I know I'll be giving uh, lectures, uh, two lectures I'll be delivering. One would be called Reforma uh, Restoration and Reformation, uh, showing you the consistency between what's being said in Acts 3 and Hebrews chapter 9, uh, where we find those two words, restoration and reformation. Uh, and also, of course, highlighting what needed to be restored and reformed. And then uh, the death of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and Romans 5 uh, is a topic that I'll be leaning in on. So I'll be highlighting that for uh, you as well. So uh, that's what I have, Rick. I hope you're ready. I'm going to unmute your mic, bring you on here, and uh, let's begin to have some conversation. Hey, brother. Hey, good morning. Hey, thanks for having me on. And uh, thanks for Dallas and, and Bob and Edward and the other lady. I forgot her name. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, that's on with us. But I really appreciate you having me on. Um, yes, I keep yeah, and I, I watch you on Facebook. I keep up with stuff to the best of my ability, you know. And so I appreciate everything that you're doing. Uh, we're going to be talking about the you know the Berean conference. I know your conference is coming later in the year. I'm excited to be up there, and uh, I think this is exciting that we're talking about. You know, I think um, we need to be able to learn how to cross pollinate. We really do, and I think that we're not. I mean, we're we're better than um, than we've used to be. I, I mean, the boroughs, like all of us, like we've learned how to cross pollinate just because of the way that our format is within our own show. And, um, but that's true. And I don't mean just preterist or full preterist or all millennialist or whatever. I mean, the church as a whole, I think that we've all, we're all coming from different walks of life. Jesus was not an American. Jesus was not from England. You know, um, we have to learn how to get along with one another and to share this message. And I think you do a great job. I think you really do put out as much information. I know we're going to get into the word strategy. I heard that in Francis Chan's prayer earlier, that word strategy. Um, I think that God's laid out a strategy for us that's pretty simple, actually, and it's to rely on him and to allow his Holy Spirit to work, but also that we get to work as well. And I think that that's where it's at. Cross-pollination will help with that, in my opinion. Amen. Yeah, I appreciate that phrase, uh, cross-pollination. I think that's needed, necessary, and, uh, you, you know, it's probably something we all could do a little bit of learning how to do that, how I can cross-pollinate. We have a lot to learn from the bees, I guess. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm grateful that you're, you're here with us, and I know you were on scene at Berean Bible Church, and I know that's not your first time being there as you've done, you know, the podcast, which hopefully most of us have listened to at this point, uh, talking with Bob. That's how I learned Bob's testimony there, and, uh, you know, I learned quite a bit about Pastor Dave, and it's one thing I have to say, Rick, is what I appreciate about the Burroughs of Berea podcast is relationship and personality means a lot. You know, uh, there's times where you can become frustrated with folks and you can say, you know, this person doesn't really talk about this topic. That's me. I'm usually saying that. Why doesn't this teacher talk about this? 
And then, or why does this teacher focus on this or, or certain things? And then when you listen to testimonies, uh, for example, listening to Pastor Dave Curtis, there were some things that he shared during his testimony on your podcast that uh, I hadn't known about him. And I, I hadn't take the, taken the time to get to know, have that relationship with him, which further uh, helped me understand Pastor Dave and understand some of the nuances in his way of expressing truths. And uh, it, it really helped me. So, you know, that's what I appreciate about the Barroso Berea's relationship really does a lot. Talk about cross-pollination. I think that's the key is uh, mm -hmm. to know one another, appreciating each other, appreciating each other when we're at one more. You do a great job of doing that, brother. Thank you. And I just want to say, I'm doing this through my phone and I keep getting interrupted. So if you hear me pause while I'm talking, it's because there's a call coming in and I'll get right back into it. Sorry. But um, thank you for saying that. And I wanted to say something really important up front. Um, and this will go into the understanding of Berean. First of all, if you listen to the boroughs of Berea, then you know that we are a very different bunch. Okay. So um, me um, and Rick Carter on the show are the only ones that are, are full preterist. Although I will tell you that there are a couple others that are in the group who have now pretty much adopted the view. I'm not going to say who it is, but they'll come out. I'll let them do that on their own. Um, we still have a few that haven't. And that's okay. I think that's the point is that it is okay. You have to understand when Tiziana Severse comes on our show and she talks, if you go back and listen to her testimony, she wasn't a part of the cast. She came on and did her testimony. And in that testimony, she told us that she was raped by a pastor. And I'm sorry to say that on the Power of Preterism Network, but that's what the reality for Tiziana Severse is. And because of that, she had to go on a path that took decades to overcome between therapy reading the Bible, prayer, everything. The fact that she came back to the Lord Jesus Christ tells you everything that you need to know about what the Holy Spirit can do for a person. But that doesn't mean that she doesn't have all of those things inside her that she still deals with when she's talking. And she's still on the path. So you might listen to the show and she might throw out a curse word, which we, <laughs> Andy, thankfully knows how to beep, you know, but she's a human being. We have to remember that she's been through some things. Um, Andy's another one. Andy is a humanist. He's an atheist. He has his reasons. He's never shared his testimony, which I've talked about it, and maybe he will. It, it's not a testimony in the same way that ours is, but it would very be, it would probably be similar to what is Derek Lambert's testimony, where you saw him deconstruct over time. You know, we're not we're not taking the testimony to bring glory to the people. We're trying to show the story of how God is working in human beings and then how those human beings respond to God. And that's where it's at. Somebody like Derek Lambert has been through the church mill. And some people will say, well, I don't know if he was ever a believer or not. Well, we, are, we can all say whatever you want. Say whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Because what matters is how he responds to God, not how I respond to God for Derek. And for me, I think that's what you have to hear. Whenever you get to the Berean Bible Church, this year was different. We had Gary DeMar there. And I got to be honest with you, I'm a huge fan of Gary DeMar. I know people, some people aren't within the full preterist movement. But we all have to admit all of his work, we've all read it and we needed it and it's helped us develop. And Gary is where he is in his path. But I think what's most important is that he's not shunning the full preterist. He actually went to the conference and talking. He doesn't hold the full preterist view. And we all wonder, well, why not? You know, why? can't you see the truth? Well, that's like me talking to Andy. Can't you see the truth, Andy? Well, of course, of course he can't. He can't see the truth like I see it. But I think that's what's the important part about cross-pollination, about our podcast. And that's why I'm not, I'm not going to change my format to please anybody else. We're going to continue to do this because people are real and this is human. And going to this conference at Berean Bible Church Conference was yet another reason for me to give glory to God. Because I saw all of these men that came in prepared. These men came in prepared, just like you, Mike. You come in prepared. You're ready to go. And you mentioned Samuel Frost earlier. Let's talk about Sam Frost for one second. I'll give him a second of my time right now. By the way, I love you, Sam. Now, a lot of people are like, what? I love Sam Frost. Now, here, check this out. Sam Frost is different. He goes hard at us. He goes hard at the hype. We call this hyper prets and all that. Of course, it gets under my skin. I'm not, sub, I'm not subhuman. But the fact is, is that we are to try to love one another. My problem with that movement is that they're saying that I'm not a believer and I'm not having it. I'm not having that. They are going to accept the fact that we are saved by the grace of God and we have come to the knowledge of the truth through the Holy Spirit, regardless of their academia. Their academia is meaningless when it comes to this. If you lose your heart, 
And then we'll talk about Glenn Hill's preaching about the heart. We'll get into that here in a moment. So anyway, Sam's going to be on the show. He, I'm flying him down. He's coming to be on our show next week. He's going to be recording with us on Thursday and Friday. I'm going to get, he's going to come and have dinner with me and my wife here in my own home. Look, some people are like, are you crazy? Oh yeah, I'm crazy. I am. I love the Lord, but I also want to try to bridge the gap. I believe that Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Yeah. Did he say it? Yeah. I'm sure there's going to be somebody that's going to tell me that, no, that's the Greek word and it means something else. Well, no, fix my English Bible then if it's not what it means. It says peacemakers. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're to be. I want to be one. I want to be a peacemaker. I don't know if I can, but I'm going to try to bridge the gap. And if Sam wants to have peace with us, then we will. But if he doesn't, then I guess I'll join the camp of everybody else who he'll ridicule. I hope not. But if that's what happens, that's what happens. You know, Rick, if I may speak to that, and I'm curious, I want to hear a bit more about Glenn Hill. Of course, uh, he, he preached a sermon here years ago called The X-Ray of an Old Preacher's Heart. So I can only imagine what he got into there at, uh, at Berean. Now, uh, what I will say is for years, right, I've said this saying, I just shared this with someone yesterday. I've always said, uh, you know, we usually have small church gatherings, you know, sometimes there's 11 people and 11 is usually great to me because I'm like, well, uh, that means that we have everybody that Jesus had except for one Judas. Thank God Judas is not here. Uh, you know, so I'll take 11. However, yesterday I, I realized and I repented of that idea. And I said, but wait a minute, Jesus didn't say he didn't want Judas around. Matter of fact, he invited him to the, you know, the Passover dinner. He was there knowing Jesus knew what Judas was going to do and yet invited him to participate in such a holy moment as the Passover dinner, the Passover Seder. So I had a dumb back and I realized I said, you know what? I want 12. I want Judas there as well. And I believe that's mm -hmm. the attitude that we should be. I want 13. I'll take two Judases. If, if Jesus, you know, was willing to be like that, we need to be like that. We need to be welcoming of people that might disagree with us. Even the, now, let me be back up here. I'm not saying Sam Frost is a Judas by any means. I was, I was getting ready to say, are you, are you calling um, Judas? Don't worry. Uh, but what I, what <laughs> I, I am know, saying is if Jesus was willing to welcome Judas there, then yes, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, incumbent upon us that we would be welcoming Sam Frost as well. So my brother, I applaud you in that. And I think that that's, that's the attitude of Jesus. That's what we should be doing. Uh, having conversations, having debate when necessary, of course, uh, but doing so with a, a good attitude. So thank you for having that ethic. Yeah. Attitude. And I think you're, look, academia and debate has its place. It's necessary. I think that it has to happen. And I'm thankful that you're one of those people that are a debater that get out there. It's just whenever that debate world crosses into normal, regular life world, that it begins to be a problem. If we understand the format, like, okay, we're going to talk about our differences and we're going to go after each other. I just watched Don Preston debate Mark Smith on Myth Vision not too long ago. And I was appalled at the behavior of that atheist. I was appalled by it because I thought he was attacking him as a human being. And I thought, this isn't an academic debate. This is just a dude who's got a very hard heart, who has exited Christianity and wants to make fun of Don Preston's PhD. It's like, come on, isn't it not obvious that Don Preston has worked his entire life and put everything that he's ever studied out there for you to read? That's, I mean, come on, why are we attacking each other on a personal? So the format matters and where that debate happens matters. And that's what's so wonderful about the Brian Bible Conference is that this is a gathering, mostly of full preterists, but not only, there are some. We had Sarita, who is not a full preterist that's on our podcast, came with us which was a blessing, you know, and we had lots of conversations through the night, you know, for after the talks and, you know, Cherry and her husband Rodney were there and they were listening to and Glenn Hill's uh, sermon just pierced their heart in a way that because they're used to old school Southern Baptist preaching up here and, you know, and he's an old school preacher and, and that's what they responded to. And it was just a, it was a wonderful sermon. If no one's heard it, please go listen to it. It's incredible. Um, and then to listen, we talked about Bob Cruikshank's Gog and Magog part one and two, and we had done an Esther series earlier in the year and how it's sort of all of this Ezekiel 37, 38, 39, or how all this works together. And oh my goodness gracious, it blessed our heart. And we just, we've been talking and talking about it. This is where it's at. So the conference gathers everybody together and we listen to these speakers and the things that they've worked on. I know Bob and I know how long he worked on what he just gave away for free for all of us to hear, you know? And you did too. I know how much you guys work and give away. So what would you like me to tell you in regard to the conference? Well, yeah. So uh, you shared a good amount already. Um, you know, I kind of wanted to just hear from your vantage point. Uh, I appreciated what Bill Evans had said that he said it was like a, 
uh, it wasn't a preterist conference in that sense, which sort of uh, shares similar to what you're saying, uh, that, uh, you know, it was a conference of like-minded believers, or it may be even times where we're not all like-minded, but willing to come together and have conversations about the kingdom of God, the reign of Christ, what Christ is doing. So, um, you know, that seems like a great area of unity there uh, in that message. Uh, you know, you mentioned Glenn Hill, uh, Bob Kruchenk, uh, Zach Davis. I know that was probably a first. Uh, what did you think of his presentation, his testimony? Uh, you know, again, and I, I want to encourage you, Rick, share with us whatever you want. What were your thoughts sure. on the Berean Bible Church Conference, uh, please? Well, first and foremost, I want to thank Pastor David Curtis and his wife, Kathy, for everything that they do. You know how hard it is to put on a conference. And when you have 100 people and you're trying to get dinners the previous night and lunches the next day and dinner the next day and uh, not to mention having everything set up and the camera set up and all that. those people put in so much work. I would have taken a vacation this week just to just to get past it. So thank you to Pastor Curtis and all of them and to all the speakers. Uh, Zach Davis traveling out from Arkansas. He brought uh, a few members from his church. Just so happens that there is a uh, uh, Carrie Thompson uh, brought uh, her. Well, let's see. It was Josh and Carrie Thompson. They brought their two daughters. And it's the youngest Burroughs fan we have. I believe she's 12. She's a huge fan of our show. So we gave her a lot of free merch and stuff, which was fun. Um, that was really what it was, is just get the fellowship with people, you know. Zach Davis, uh, <laughs> he's a young, he reminds me a lot of Michael Sullivan, except like he said in one of his sermons or one of his talks, I don't have the charts, you know, because Mike Sullivan is the chart master, you know, putting all that. But he kind of reminds me of a, a younger Mike Sullivan, but he's got such a heart. He's got a pastor's heart. He reminds me of you too, Mike, that pastor's heart for his congregation and that if they hear the scriptures that, um, that they apply them, you know, in love. And I think that's what I loved about Zach, a brilliant guy. He's talking about John the Baptist. We've done a study on John the Baptist earlier. He just expounded even more on that. It's just, it, was, it was great. Um, so let's talk about Glenn Hill now. Yeah, please jump in. Tell us. We love to talk about Glenn Hill at Blue Point, so uh, I'd love to talk about him here. Glenn Hill quoted, I believe it was, and Bob, you might have to help me. I think it was Joel Rosenauer who he quoted, and he said, preterists have a great intellect, but do they have a great heart? Mm -hmm. And I thought, man, I know that it's true. Like, I know you, Mike. I know you've got a loving heart, and I also know that you have fire in you, and you want to come out of people, but you know, I thought when we sat there, we listened to that. I saw people crying in there. Like it was almost like a conviction that came over. So I know all of us Burroughs did. Like I had tears in my eyes too. And uh, some of the people from Zach's church there, they were, they mentioned this. He talked about the city and how the gates, there were 12 gates that remained open and how the spirit and the brides, they come and how those are on the outside we're calling those on the outside. And that is the time in which we live. If you are, if you hold a dispensational view, you're, you're looking to that future time when that's going to happen, but that's not the case is, is that we're living in this place now where there are people that are outside of the gates that do not have what we have. And we got to call them and we've got to, we've got to say, come, you know, and bring them. And it was just, Oh, it was a precious message. And by the time I was, he was done with it. I was done for the day but we we're only halfway through, <laughs> but it was great, you know, and then, um, of course, Bob with Gog and Magog and his, his presentations, oh my goodness, go watch it, he's just, yeah, he nails it, Mike Sullivan talked about some things, you know, that were kind of eye-opening, I, I, some things I guess I just didn't, I wasn't aware of, um, that are actually going on in society today, it's the conferences, how now, you know, how shall we then live, and if you look over at what's going on with banks and some of the corporations that are in our country, in our world, really, that are controlling our lives in these odd ways, these weird ways. And we know we all use our phones like Apple and Android. And we have, you know, we sign these statements. That, oh, yeah. You know, you can have rights to our privacy. <laughs> you know, like he just he, it was eye opening. And then when he got into First Corinthians 15, um, for those who are very ardent studiers. Um, it's a really good one. It's just, if you're not, it doesn't take long for your brain to get lost in the weeds. There's a lot of information, but that needs to be there too. It's important, you know? Yeah, that's, you know, actually I look forward to uh, Matt. Uh, Matt Massaro was there uh, at the conference and he's going to be joining us on Monday at 2 p.m. 
uh, this coming Monday to talk a little bit about the conference and his experience. And he mentioned 1 Corinthians 15 being obviously I'm in the middle of that study. And, you know, I'll say I just taught part eight parts of 1 Corinthians uh, 15 in the last couple months. And yes, there's a lot going on. It's easy to kind of lose. Paul's saying a whole bunch of different stuff, at, you, you know, at once. And, you know, talking about a seed, talking about perishableness, imperishable, uh, you, you know, all these different things that I think people need to really dive into the text and spend some time there. It shouldn't be something that, you know, uh, we're just, oh, I totally understand. You, you know, if, if you're mm-hmm. doing that, I question that. So I look forward to uh, listening to Mike Sullivan uh, on 1 Corinthians 15. He's been, you know, I said this on Monday, Mike Sullivan's been one of the giants in my understanding of preterism in 1 Corinthians 15, particularly. Uh, he's been one of the folks that really helped hammer that home for me. And uh, obviously, you know, there's unity and diversity being spoken to right here. Uh, as, uh, you know, Mike and I, we have our moments of disagreement, but uh, he's always been a blessing. And I look forward to even listening uh, to his uh, lecture there in, in regards to the Great Reset. I know I saw the title and uh, it was a little frustrating for me, but I, I figure I want to listen to it. I want to hear what he has to say. And uh, that leans right in on what I shared earlier about, you know, the social atmosphere has a lot to do with the theological things being spoken about. So uh, we can look in the history of the church and see that. But then I think it's also important for us, like you said, the topic of the conference is how then shall we live? Well, then we do need to consider society around us, some of the the mess that's going on and uh, use that to, uh, it should disturb us. It hopefully it'll encourage us at some points. And uh, yeah, so I look forward to uh, leaning in on what Mike Sullivan had to say there at the conference and being blessed by that as well. And well said regarding 1 Corinthians 15, so. Yeah, and last but not least, you know, Gary Damar, you know, being there, I've, I've loved getting to know Gary. Uh, I, I know him very little. He's been on our show, and I've met him a couple times. I haven't really spent a whole lot of time talking to him, but, I, you know, we have his body of work. You can see American Vision and all the stuff that he does. You can see the podcast he does with Kim Burgess. I mean, there's, or listen to it. There's, there's plenty of information, you know, out there about Gary. I guess the best part about it is that he actually was being a genuinely nice person. He was there. Um, I would say if you want to get into the fame game, most people know who Gary DeMar are on this side of the world. And, but you wouldn't know it talking to him, meeting him face to face. He is just a normal person, Mm -hmm. just like you and me. And these men who have come out against him, um, just by even being a part of something that we're trying to discuss, which is eschatology and, and worldview, and they don't even want him to be a part of it. And, and he refuses to do that. And I commend him for that. I think that that's, you know, I guess it could be dangerous for, for his profession, but he says many times that he doesn't care. Um, he's just going to continue to talk. Um, the fact that he comes at it from with years of experience, um, I think is, it's important for us to remember that. I think, um, I know I'm, I'm new to preterism and so I'm all of a sudden I come on the scene and I'm talking you know but I, I you know I don't have that history like you do Mike I mean you've got you know a decade or more I, I think I just saw congratulations by the way on your 10-year anniversary of preaching at Blue Point um, what a remarkable thing that you've done that for 10 years and um, so you've been around a long time you've been at this fight for a long time it would be easy if I were you and I was in your in your shoes Whenever you see someone like Gary DeMar come in and start saying things like, you need a strategy, that that would feel offensive for somebody that has had nothing but strategy for a decade of trying to do that and and being maybe even discarded by these others because of the way that they are, the elite, I guess you would call them. But I don't, I don't want our hearts to get that way. And it's easy for me. I've only been doing it for a couple of years, but I don't want our hearts to get that way. I think that part of peace is understanding that, okay, here comes this guy. Now he's going to come in our world and he's going to tell us what to do. That's kind of the feeling, you know, it's like, what? But I think he has a right to talk out loud. I think he's been attacked enough from the dispensationalists over the last 40 years. And he's fought the good fight on that side, being called a heretic and you name it, to, to finally, you know, come on this side and to, well, not just finally, I mean, he's done it before, but to come over here and talk, I think we should try to let our hearts be open and listen. Let's try, you know, and if he comes out later on and says, listen, if you don't change to my view, then you're a heretic. (laughs) I'd be shocked. I just don't see that happening. I think eschatology and understanding the Bible is difficult. 
you know, there are simplicities to the scripture, which is our salvation and praise to God that Christ did it for us and we because we couldn't. And I think our salvation and then how we live our lives is it's really critical. That that's where it's at. That's what you as a pastor will give us on a week to week basis of like the things that we encounter, what's going on around our world, how to live, how to love. But when you start getting into these other big topics that you've been into, you know, with debates, somebody like Gary is going to be bringing a lot of a wealth of knowledge to the table that I think can help all of us as we go out into this worldview, you know, and with this worldview talking. Do you, would you agree? I mean, I think you've done a tremendous, I've looked at a lot of your work, Mike, and you've been on, you've had a strategy. I've seen it. And I, I could understand why you might, you know be a little upset about that i can totally get that you know yeah you know and you said it very well and i appreciate the way you framed that is that you know there is that like we said at the beginning getting to know somebody's testimony getting to have a relationship with someone where you you learn to be more patient with people and, and you know gary and i to be very fair we don't have a relationship i, I know his testimony right. listening to him on podcasts uh, i we have a little bit of a relationship it's an annoying one it's me messaging him incessantly for probably about a decade so uh you know give him grace and, and give me grace please uh but you know so there is that sense where i realize it's important to step back and realize he is just another brother in the faith wrestling with this as well just like us you know and mm -hmm. uh, whereas you know uh, me and dallas we have some differences and i might be more gracious to him because we have a relationship where we you know we right. meet other here weekly and talk and and go through these things so there is that there is on the to flip that coin there is that sense where you know and i've been paying attention to gary you know uh for quite some the, the last couple months and really what's been going on and uh you know and i do attribute a lot of your podcast i think even the naysayers attribute your podcast to probably being a part of the current controversy because gary was willing to be on your podcast and uh you know and that stirred some things i think he said some things there that uh, folks found, you know, the, 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 uh, the guardians of the galaxy, so to speak, by the way, there's, a, <laughs> uh, but you know, the, uh, you know, they, they're really, uh, trying to, um, guard that. And, you know, I've had interaction with some of these folks. I mean, there was a church, uh, just to give a little bit of background, Gary DeMar visited Long Island. I, I only know of him visiting one time. I'm sure he's visited here other times being that he at least visited once he visited a church here on Long Island, Hope Reformed Baptist Church. Well, a couple months ago, that almost maybe about a year now, uh, September. So it's not quite a year yet. But back in September, I visited that congregation and I was escorted out. So, uh, you know, being that I know Gary has rubbed elbows with these folks that he's, you know, he, he knows them. Uh, I, I feel that he has more stock in this conversation. And that's where, you know, I say, okay, for years, I've been saying that there is a world beautiful preterism. It's not just, you know, point back to AD 70. Let's talk about, you know, what happened in AD 70. There are folks that are helping, trying to foster healthy environments and congregations, especially for the used, you know, the, the misused and abused Christians that have unfortunately been a part of this, where, uh, you know, me, I get the privilege of serving in a pastorate, and this looks like fun. You know, I get to fight the good fight for the faith. But then I think about the Christians that have been told they're not allowed to be at church anymore, and their name is on the uh, pray for these folks list. That's it. That's like their, mm -hmm. their next step. And so for me, I, it does frustrate me when I, you know, I listen to Gary and by the way, I think he did a great presentation. Uh, the thing would be, as I said on another commentary on Facebook, I said, I believe he's speaking to an immaturity that we've, many of us full preterists have already moved past. We, we don't mm -hmm. have this problem of hyper preterism, uh, you know, where we're saying it's all in the past and there's nothing else. I've never said that. I've never believed that, um, mm -hmm. you know, and also, we, we, we know the problems with futurism. We know the hyper futurist dispensationalist ethic. Uh, so a lot of what he said, and again, there's people at different places, like you very well said. So I'm sure there were people that when Gary spoke at Berean, that they were encouraged and they said, you know, this is, this is what we need to be hearing. This is true. Uh, and, and I know I can share that video. Obviously, you know, a little bit of the backroom conversation here where, uh, you know, I've talked about strategy for years and I felt him say a lot of, you know, we need to strategize. And I was like, well, we've been strategizing. So let us tell you what we've been doing and maybe we can work, we can uh, cross pollinate to borrow that phrase. Yeah. You know, and, and I would agree with that a hundred percent. I agree with that, Mike. Amen. Well, you have done the work and I hope that he will be just as patient with you as you have with him in regard to this. That's what we would want because what's the ultimate goal is that everyone can hear that everything that Jesus said would happen. He did, he did it. And now we get to live in this, that joy and the fullness and the peace that he gave us. So let's get that message out there, you know, and let's show people 
how you shall then live. That's right. Amen. Well said. Well, you know, I'm not going to go on about all my frustrations, Rick. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> But uh, what I'd like to do, you know, I want to make sure you feel you've exhausted some combo. I did un- encourage uh, Bob to unmute if he wants to jump in here. Uh, we can have some conversation uh, as well. Uh, and then I'll bring everyone else on to have some further feedback. How does that sound? Bob, I see you're unmuted. you have anything you want to jump in here and say? Yeah, I'm, I was going to say I need to look up cross-pollinated because I've heard that <laughs> a lot. Uh, that has to do with botany, right? Yeah, imagine. it's just basically, yeah, join, it's kind of like whenever you do uh, the grafting of a wild olive shoot with a natural one. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Now it all makes sense. Um, no, I'd probably just uh, echo what Rick was saying. Um, and it, when Rick said that, you know, he hasn't been a preterist that long, uh, that's one of the things that struck me at the conference is so many people there. Uh, I was trying to try my best. I don't know how successful I was, but to reach out to, uh, you know, new faces, um, introduce myself, make them welcome. And um, there were so many people that uh, a couple of them, it was probably a year or less uh, that they had been preterist. And um, of course, a lot, they had a lot of questions, most of which uh, I couldn't answer. Um, but uh, that's why I kind of thought Glenn's message was so good because it seems like when so many people become preterist, uh, that becomes everything to them. And I think it was probably good for the new people to hear that reminder that Glenn had that it's not, it's not all about preterism. Uh, there's a lot more to it than that. And um you know, so that right from early on, they don't fall into the temptation of losing their focus on the gospel and things like that. And uh, Zach, Zach's a great guy. I never met him in person, um, corresponded with him here and there. We've talked on the phone, but it was great to meet him in person. And I tell you what, uh, like Rick said, Zach is a young, younger version of Mike Sullivan. Uh, just what a tremendous what a tremendous communicator, tremendous speaker, very talented, very well-spoken. Um, Zach did a great job. And uh, obviously, Gary, I, you know, loved all three of his messages. Um, been following Gary since 1988. Uh, and he was just, it was just great to be there and listen to him in person. Um, and I wanted to piggyback on something that Rick said. Mike's uh, message about the great uh, reset and responding to the new world order. When Rick had brought that up, Rick had mentioned, you know, cell phones and computers and Facebook and Zoom. And if you think about it, you know, we're sitting here using cell phones and computers on Facebook, utilizing Zoom, none of which was created by believers. And hence, the kind of problems that Mike was talking about. And I was just thinking to myself, none of this would ever hap- would have ever happened if God's people wouldn't have withdrawn culturally in the first place. And a lot of that, I think, has to do with dispensationalism, which is where I focus most of my time and energy trying to get people out of dispensationalism so that God's people can realize that Christ isn't coming back to take us out of the world. He left us here to change the world. And we need to, again, begin to become involved uh, in this world around us. Um, Just real quick, there's a great video on YouTube by the guy's name, Rashal Mangawadi. And uh, it's all about how, I forget the title of it, but you can look up the name how Christians have withdrawn from society since the rise of dispensationalism. And he focuses specifically on the area of the judiciary. Um, Christians aren't pursuing careers in that field. And, you know, look, look what's happened. Uh, And I think that's the, uh, the importance of preterism is to get, especially the younger people to realize 
um, that they're going to be here for a while and uh, maybe pursue careers in these fields where it would actually make a difference. Um, and maybe things won't be like they are, you know, down the road in the next generation. And that's, that's what the conference was all about. How then shall we live after 8070? And uh, that's really what it's all about. 8070 is behind us. God wants us to move forward in this new creation as his image bearers, being the salt in the, in the world and the light in the world that we're called to be to make this world what he wants it to be. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mike. I appreciate what you said there, Bob. And I will say, uh, you know, one thing, and again, I'm a young guy, I'm 39 years old. So you mentioned, uh, oh, you're young, man. <laughs> you've been uh, learning from Gary since 1989. So I have to say, you know, humility hit me hard in that moment there. I was like, Mike, relax. You're a young guy. So, you know, there's that. And then also, uh, you know, each of us, you mentioned, you know, where you're laboring is a lot of times bringing people out of dispensationalism. Uh, and that's another area where I, you know, God is always giving me a humbling moment. So uh, another thing is, is just being honest and say, or being willing to realize we're all working in our area. So as much as I want to mm -hmm. be frustrated with Gary, and I might say, man, you know, Gary, speak to me, talk to Mike, tell me what I need to do. Uh, you know, I know that Gary has his ministry to the folks that he's been laboring in and working in. And that should cause all of us to give each other grace in the areas that we're, you know, we're laboring and, and saying the things that maybe the people we're speaking to need to hear. So thank you for that, Bob. Something oh, that, you. um, I'm oh, sorry, Bob, didn't mean to interrupt in there. Uh, something that Gary uh, said that really hit me uh, was on his final message. And he says that he talks about whenever the apostle Paul, I think it's in Acts chapter 16, where he and Silas are, they're trying to be silenced and they're beating them and they put them in prison, right? And so they, he, then Paul says, I'm a Roman citizen. And how it changes the tune a little bit. Now they want to try to get rid of him at night. And he says, no, nope, you're going to do this in the public, right? And so what Gary was trying to bring out was like, hey, look, he didn't say, hey, I'm a Christian, so you can do whatever you want to me. And it's going to be okay. And I'm not going to use my citizenship because I have a citizenship. He was right. I thought, you know, it's a good point. Paul, who was bringing the message to the Gentiles, is showing us, in, well, at least the book of Acts is showing us what Paul did, is that the system in which he was born or the system in which getting a Roman citizenship whenever you were from Turkey, that costs some money. That costs something. So he had a benefit that some of these other people didn't have. And so he utilized that benefit. And we live in America and we have our rights as Americans. And rather than give them up, we need to use them. Those are the rights that we have. That's what Gary DeMar taught me on that Sunday. And I took it and I thought, you know what? I've had, I am a pacifist and I have all kinds of things, but he's right. We have a system, we need to use it. And in order to get out the message, we have to use the system in which we were in or citizens of. And I thought, yep. That was good. I really liked that. And I commend Gary on that. Well said. Bob, you were going to say something before? Uh, it wasn't anything major. I can't remember what it was. So it must not have been too important. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you know, again, I, I appreciate what you said. You, you encouraged me and humbled me a bit. You know, I have to remember that I am a young guy. I'm new at this. And I'm sure Gary's looking at me as that annoying. Uh, so, you know, I always look at like a small dog barking, you know, and, and that's what I, I feel like. <laughs> Well, that's what you just said there, Harry, looking at you as annoying. I, uh, I used to call American Vision when I was like 19 years old and in my early 20s, like every single week. And uh, I'd call and I'd say, um, is Gary DeMar there? I have a question. And I'd bring up whatever <laughs> Bible verse or whatever. And him and Ralph Parker also worked there at the time, and uh, I didn't realize this. Tim Burgess was there at the time, too, so they were all there. But I had never met uh, Gary's wife, Carol, before, but actually I had because here she was the secretary who was answering the calls. So when I would call and say, um, I have a question. Can I talk to Gary DeMar? Carol was the person I talked to. So uh, trust trust me, Mike. Um, you could not possibly be more annoying to him than I was. 
I was back in my <laughs> early 20s calling it. So, you know, I just want to encourage you there. Don't worry about that it, brother. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, that, that's, that's good. And, you know, it shows that Gary's dealt with far more than I, this 39 year old man, uh, come to know, you know, and uh, I, I think that, you know, he's dealt with this for years and, and decades. And uh, I'm very encouraged by his work. By the way, we mentioned Kim, uh, Kim Burgess there. He, he's been another blessing. You know, the podcast is great. Oh, yeah. Uh, Amen. Yeah. I'm sure, we've all heard it. And, you know, I, even there, I've had my moments of frustration. Uh, Kim and I had a great back room. You know, we did a phone chat and talked a bit and, uh, you know, gave each other some, some talking space to hear out our differences. And, uh, you know, it was very encouraging. And again, it speaks to what we were saying before about just having a relationship and having testimony and uh, being willing to talk with one another. So uh, I want to be clear uh, this morning that I'm very grateful for Gary DeMar. I'm very grateful for Berean and everything they did. Uh, I'm grateful for Gary. And, you know, he, he is being courageous. You know, at the end of the day, I, I said to someone more recently, I said, is it wrong for a preacher to be worried that they might not be able to uh, care for their family? Uh, if they, you know, the rugs pulled out from under their feet, is that wrong? Uh, you know, some folks want to say, well, you're a preacher, you should never care about finances or money. Well, yeah, tell that to my wife. Uh, you, you know, so, yeah. I mean, come on now, there, there has to be a human, a humanness in this, where Gary's put in a lot of work, he does deserve to defend his reputation, his ministry, uh, and use wisdom in how he's going about that. So that's something that I've really had to impress upon myself, and even reach out to other folks and remind them, you know, hey, take it easy here. Because, you know, in the midst of the, the rage, I guess we can say things that are just not, that, you know, oh, he shouldn't care about the money. It's like, well, all right, let's try that on for a minute here. Uh, you, mm -hmm. you know, I think we all know that, that that's not exactly the correct way to say that. So, uh, yes, I appreciate the, the sentiments there and the appreciation for all these men that are, you know, walking uh, their walk. I'm even reading, uh, obviously, Francis Chan brought us to Ephesians 4, and there's that text, and I'm going to read this in closing later. However, uh, it says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And, you know, that's where I, you know, my heart is this morning is, is growing in that truth right there, giving the grace to each, God's given us grace. So therefore we are required to give each other grace as well. And that's one of my takeaways from this morning. Uh, if you gentlemen don't mind, can I unmute some mics uh, so you can hear some other folks' takeaways, questions, and comments? Sure. Cool. All right. Going to go about unmuting the mics. Dallas, I see you're unmuted. You want to jump in here? Yeah, what I'd like to do is uh, dogpile on everything that's kind of been said. Uh, but before I do that, I highly want to get everybody listening. Uh, if you haven't done it, go through Mike's uh, Corinthians 15 study. Uh, I've been researching, you know, doing this like we've all done for the bulk of the time that we've done seriously looking at things. And in my opinion, you know, I'm not going to poo-poo on anybody else's work but Mike's work is very good it's helped me greatly even to see things that I've never been able to encapsulate in any type of idea there's just been words or ideas and Mike's videos go through it in a way that it clarifies so much stuff so depending on what you have for a history definitely go check it out I highly highly recommend it so if you know, any of you subs to my stuff that aren't familiar with Mike's stuff, please go and check it out. Uh, I also want to point out and add on to what uh, Bob was referring to with that uh, speech by um, Sullivan on the New World Order. And I want to say it's about time. The church has to wake up to real life world issues that are going to affect us. They might not be affecting us on our wake up, go to work, come home, what we think day-to-day -day process is, but our day-to-day -day process is affected by every one of these giants in our world today's decisions. And these giants are leading us around and we need to use our citizenship to rise up and take and put our stake in the ground. Otherwise, they're just gonna come and take it away. And it's a reality that I, am, I was very happy to hear especially considering that futurism and i don't mean to attack them but they can't take that position they can't take the let's try and make something better happen in our world which leads to the point of where i'd like to kind of dog pile on what was collectively said which is the futurism unfortunately has created a culture of fear and rigidness uh, when it comes to learning and that, I think, is because if you position yourself back into the time period of Acts, thinking that the end is right upon us, 
they're also positioning themselves to the fear of all the false teachers. You can't fall away. If you slip away, you'll be rejected. And they're all caught up in that same mindset of I'm too scared to even look at what other people are saying because I don't want to be rejected before the coming destruction. So I think that's where, you know, futurism and the reason why I have to bring up futurism is obviously we know they're the biggest uh, percentage of believers right now. So that that's a really big impact onto why the church isn't that one mind yet. And I think uh, Bob's doing a, a great thing by making that. And, you know, it's his blessing from God to take on those concerns to help people move out of it. But now I also want to move into what Rick was talking about, because I think they blend together. And I'm going to pick on my life as kind of what I'm saying. So when I came into believing, I was an atheist. I was a hardcore atheist. I actively sought out religious people to make their lives a living hell because I thought they were so ridiculous. So I started from a place of nothing. And that led me into when I went through my conversion experience into futurism, which then led me into universalism, which led me into partial preterism, which led to full preterism that now includes covenant creation. Well, if I really want to say that I can't fellowship with a futurist. I can't fellowship with a universalist, so on and so forth. And I condemn them because they don't think the way I do. I'm condemning myself. Amen. And I'm removing every stepping stone it took to get me here. That's right. So when, and like Mike was saying, you know, Judas was brought to the table. Well, we're all Judas until we go through stepping stone after stepping stone till that Judas part of us is removed. So, I'm going to adulterate some scripture here on purpose, but just to prove a point, in Romans 9, we read, um, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills, nor on the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. And I think that's what we need to focus on. See, mercy came to me from my stint in universalism. That's when I learned mercy, because just as the scripture says, we only love because he loves us. So it's because of his love I've learned to love. Well, it's because of his mercy that I am part of it. So how can I then, like I said earlier, look at any stage I went through without looking back now on it as mercy? Because that's all God saw through me. Because he knew I was wrong. Then my next step, he knew I was wrong. Then my next step, he knew I was wrong. It was mercy carrying me the whole way through. And it still does. So when we look at other people, like God has everyone on their path. And he's bringing us all to where we need to be. So I'm going to really press this on us who are mature and say, we then are the ones who are responsible for a greater degree of mercy. Let those who are weak in their mercy and have fear come into our house so that they can have mercy poured upon them. Don't reject anyone. Bring them to your table. Make sure that you are realizing in your heart they're having mercy upon you when they bring you to their table. Just as the full preterist brought in a partial preterist with Gary DeMar and they fed from his works. So I just want to dogpile on what everybody's saying here and say that that is something that I personally think is a very important conversation that needs to be had. And it needs to be done with love and mercy and, re and you know, the theme of it's real people. Remember, we all each have a history. We all each needed mercy and we're always going to need mercy. So whatever you say, whatever you do, if you're not doing it out of the fact that God gave you mercy and you're not pouring out mercy, then maybe you ought to look at the motivation that you're walking in because without mercy, there is no body. So that's, that's, that's what I'm gaining. That's what I was going through in my head, listening to you guys all speak this morning. And I, I think it's a very important thing as that, that's the fundamental law, love one another. Amen. That's a great urge toward maturity. If you don't mind, I just wanted to go ahead and uh, I know Bob has to leave here. So I wanted to thank you, Bob, for being here this morning with us. 
And, uh, you know, if I've never said this, thank you for the many emails and PDF files you've sent me and the host of work that you've done uh, in the Preterist community. You've been uh, far more of a blessing than you probably know or that I've ever really exhausted in conversation. And I look forward to following up with you and having you as an interview here on our, our uh, session. Thanks, Mike. Back at you. Love you, brother. Thank you so much for having me on the show. All right. God bless you, brother. And we'll talk with you soon. See you, Mike. See you, guys. See ya. God bless. Um, Edward, I, I know you're here. You want to jump in. I don't see Vicky's mic unmuted. Vicky, I want to encourage you. Uh, if you want to unmute and share some thoughts, please feel welcome to do so. But Edward, jump in here. I'm sure you got some thoughts you want to share. Yes, sure. I would like to uh, first address, you know, those that are in power, like the banks and stuff like that, that's affecting our lives and all of these things. And we, when you have mentioned about grace, you know, how grace has been extended to us and how we're to extend grace to others, you know, it's not only for the body of believers, but also for those that are not believers, because we don't know, like, where they're going to be down the road, if the seeds will, you know, germinate and become, you know, that of the new. Um, yes. So, like, like the day of prayer, you know, um, I feel that we need to pray for those people that have, that are in power and that are making certain decisions that's affecting us. We have to pray for them. You know, we're to continue in letting our light shine in our lives, you know, that we may be an influence to those around us, but our prayers are very effective to us when we pray for those that are in power, that God may, you know, move in their lives and things of this nature. And then I had wanted to mention to Rick that I had been uh, listening to the covenant hermeneutics and biblical eschatology in the uh, uh, the uh, one diamond with many facets. And then there was another one I had listened to. Uh, I forgot, uh, did, uh, 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 dissection and vivisection. I listened to that. Yeah. I had also listened to uh, some of Ruth, the book of Ruth, and also when Pastor Michael was on your program. So, you know, I got a little taste of, you know, your, your round table, which I feel is very, beautiful how you cross pollinate to use your term <laughs> um is really wonderful because um what we're doing we're meeting people where they are you know which is so important you know to allow people to be who they are and give them that venue where they feel safe and secure where they can actually express what they believe without being ostracized you know no matter what the belief may be you know and when they're open to, you know, be civil and would like to conversate, you know, that's, that's, that's just such a large step, you know, which I feel is really wonderful. And to adjust that, that clip that uh, you had shown uh, with the gentleman, um, what, what was the gentleman's name with the clip? Francis Chan. Francis Chan. Yes. Um, and what was the premise of some of what he had said? Just well, get talking National Day of Prayer, basically saying that uh, he doesn't know where the where the church is going to unite, how the church is going to unite. It's such yes, a okay, yes, because what what I have summarized in Scripture is how we are known is by the love we show towards one another. You know, that's how our unif unification can begin. You know, as as well as accepting people where they are, you know, because God had, like, like Judas, for instance, uh, Jesus had invited him to the Seder, to the Last Supper, knowing that he would betray him, but yet he showed love to him anyway. And that, that brings me back to um, where, where we, we heard a, a saying of, um, would you die for someone that you love or someone that has treated you well. And most people would say, yes, but would you pray for that one that was bullying you? That one that was, you know, ostracizing you and you know, treating you horribly, would you die for them? And some people would say, no, <laughs> but yet yeah, Jesus did, you know? So that, that just demonstrates, you know, his love that we need to demonstrate to others as far as giving others grace to where they are and not to give up on people not to give up on people, be persistent in our prayers because you as a testimony, like you, like you stated, Mike, 
when you first heard it, it was like, you know, one ear out of the other, you know? <laughs> and then, you know, uh, the, the seed grew into where you are now. And it's just, you know, wonderful that, you know, your, your, your mom and, and your aunts, your grandmother had not, forget, had not given up on you, you know, with prayer. And God bless where you are now and how it's affecting our lives, you know? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Edward. And again, there, it just shows there's a lot of growth, maturity, and unity that we all need to work toward in our own walks, our own lives. And, and I pray that as we talk about these things, we're impressing that upon ourselves. Uh, I'm hearing it. And, uh, you know, that we're encouraging other people to, to do so as well. Uh, because I need, I, need, I need to hear this message because remember I told you my, 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 my uh, attention span was short due to it was probably to something AM <laughs> and I didn't fully give ear. And then when you had told me that uh, the card tricks were for the children, I wasn't aware that children were in the audience and stuff like this. So the, that would have encouraged me to really give ear, you know, if I would have known that, but still, you know, um, give grace to where grace is needed, you know, and where it's due and, you know, uh, 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 listen to people with holy listening, with comprehension and understanding what, pe what people are saying and things of this nature, yes. Amen. Well, uh, Rick was there on scene, so he knows the uh, different lectures that were given. Dallas, it sounds like Dallas has made a good run uh, through many of the uh, the lectures there. Uh, I'm still working on it, as I mentioned, and most of you that know me know I listen to things at least three times before I really begin to understand uh, what's going on. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on my, like I said, my second time listening to Zach, and uh, I'm a note taker, so you'd imagine I'm constantly jotting down stuff and citing people's words. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm in the middle of that. Edward, it sounds like you're, you're kind of where I'm at. You, you still need to go back, double back, and do some reading, uh, some listening and, and listen, uh, learning. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, which is good because next week we're going to continue conversation about Berean. Uh, as I mentioned on Monday, we're going to have Matt Massaro uh, join with us. Matt's been a blessing in my Tuesday night study. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been privileged to have fellowship with him. Actually, I know some of us uh, as well. Uh, Dallas, I know you fellowshiped with him as well. Uh, so he'll be on on Monday. He'll share some thoughts with us, a bit of his testimony as well, where he's he's at in his uh, journey of preterism. Uh, maybe he'll even share a bit about his journey of church history. Uh, I know him and I have had some talks in that regard. And um, yeah, and we'll be blessed. So uh, I thank you, Edward, for your thoughts there. Dallas, of course, I thank you for yours. Rick, I thank you for being here. Before you me. shut down, I just want to uh, reinforce what Edward was saying there. And I've heard Rick say it and and myself although i do want to say i didn't realize we were so young so i'm just gonna say timothy <laughs> uh you you do have a blessing upon you and a gift upon you that is the spirit of what we are talking about i do believe that your openness and allowance for disagreements falls into my definition of what is the point even of the gospel what is the point of the gospel is to enter god's presence and that's what you foster and yeah you say you get enough praise and that kind of stuff but it's because you do put in the work like rick said this is over 10 years of pastoral you had to go through how many years of torment as you were ra uh, raised out of what you were to come even into this so you know the fact that i can sit here you can sit there and we both know that we have some very far apart uh, perspectives and we have some very close perspectives but that's not the issue the issue is you foster the presence of God, the safety, you bring us into a sanctuary, and you allow us to be who we are, how we are. You don't take offense. You don't press offense. You don't talk offense about other people. You're a man of truth, and I appreciate your ministry and what you're doing. Thank you. Appreciate that. God so if I get to Miano Van Weil, I can get the... Uh... The, the list of the speakers and things of that nature. Yeah, you're, you're talking about from Berean? Yes. Yeah, I'll send you the link over, Edward. You and I have good uh, fellowship here. I could simply send you a text. So I'll send, yeah. you, send you the link over and I'll let you be blessed by it. Yes, thank you. Is, I'm, I'm curious, Mike, is there ever going to be a Miano go soft? Yeah, I think, <laughs> you know, some folks have said that they've said Miano's gone mild uh, at this point. So, uh, <laughs> ah, I love it. Yeah, yeah, you know, stay wild, yeah. brother. Stay wild, but be That's mild. Right. Stay <laughs> wild, but allow the Lord to do the mildness. I'll, I'll allow there him to do some work on me. Amen. Absolutely. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm.
Uh, well, uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, Rick, do you have anything uh, that you'd like to share just to kind of close out our program? No, I just wanted to thank you for having me on and uh, very well spoken, Dallas. I agree. I agree with what you said about Pastor Miano. I feel the same way. I'm blessed to know all of you. Edward, thank you for all your kind words. And, uh, I, you know, and I'll talk to Bob later, but thanks for doing this, Mike. I enjoyed it today. Thank you. I'm glad. Yeah. And that's, Hey, that if we could get an hour of power, why not? Right. So absolutely being here, uh, obviously uh, years ago, if you watch some of my stuff, it was me talking to my computer by myself. So <laughs> well, there's many blessings that come behind that. Uh, obviously I don't want to turn this into uh, just sitting here talking about each other, but each of you know, uh, you've served as a blessing in my life and, you know, I do give God the glory. That's not just a vain repetition at the end of it, you know, uh, to God be the glory in that. And I do, I stand upon the shoulders of giants. It's been men of God, women of God in the community of faith that have nurtured the things that I've come to learn, the attitude that I have. Uh, it comes from the people that I get to rub elbows with, uh, whether it's here on social media or uh, in real life here at the Blue Point Bible Church. So uh, thank all of you for, you know, mm -hmm. pressing these things upon me. So, uh, Again, to God be the glory. Uh, we're not going to be here Monday morning. Uh, we're going to be here Monday afternoon, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we're going to have Matt join with us. We try to take license to uh, work with people's schedules. So uh, I hope you might tune in at 2 p.m. on Monday afternoon uh, to be blessed by another hour of power here with us. Uh, I thank each of you for the ministries that are represented. Of course, we want to encourage you. Listen to the Burroughs of Berea. I listen on Spotify. I know there's a host of different ways uh, you could listen. Just go to their website. You can find all those different ways, uh, burroughsofberea.com. Uh, then you have Dallas, of course, on YouTube uh, with Better Understanding the Bible. Uh, Dallas, I'm still going through that last video, but we're going to get to some chatting uh, here soon. And, uh, and then Edward, of course, Edward has his blog, Thinking Through Theology, edhowell.wordpress.com. Edward, I want to thank you for your most recent blog, as you did link back to some of my first Corinthians work. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, let's keep working uh, to the glory of God and, and trust that God's going before us and all that we do. Uh, and with that, I'll just conclude in a prayerful manner, reading through Ephesians chapter four, verses one through seven. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. God bless and go in peace. Thanks, brother.